Greetings everyone and welcome to the online service of Stanley Park Baptist Church. We're so glad that you could join us today. We're going to worship the Lord once again, pray together, listen to the Word. It's going to be a great time in the Lord. Before we begin, let me read Psalm 93 for you. It says, The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves, mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a mighty, awesome God to me. And that's who we've come to worship and praise. And this God loves us so much that He made the ultimate sacrifice to save us, to rescue us, to redeem us. And here we are, saved and grateful. Let's worship Him for who He is and let's praise Him for what He's done. What a loving Father our God is. Faithfulness 
to 
Pastor Peter here. How are all my Bible Town people doing this week? I pray you're doing well, and I hope you're getting to spend time with Jesus every day. Now, I don't know about you, but getting to spend more time at home in the last few months has really allowed me to spend more time with God. And one of the things that I've learned during this time is that I need to be humble in my relationship with Him. Often, unfortunately, I'm tempted to believe that I'm actually a really good person, which is not true. The truth is, is that I'm a sinner and, and God knows that. And so when I talk to him, it's really important for me to be humble and honest with him. I have to admit that I am a sinner and that I must be humble before God. Now, this might be hard to understand for some of us. So why don't we look at today's devotional together, which will hopefully help us understand this. And so today's devotional is taken from Luke chapter 18, verse 14, which reads, Everyone who lifts himself up will be brought down, and anyone who brings himself down will be lifted up. Now, this verse actually comes from a story told by Jesus. It was about a Pharisee who was a proud religious person and a tax collector. And unfortunately, tax collectors were hated by most people. And this is how Jesus told the story. One day, a Pharisee and a tax collector went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee stood away from the tax collector and prayed out loud. He said things like, God, I thank you that I'm not as bad as other people, that I am better than those men who steal and cheat or do evil things. I thank you that I'm not a sinner like this tax collector. Two times a week, I skip eating to pray, and I give one-tenth of everything I have away. Now the tax collector stood alone too, but when he prayed, he would not even look up to heaven. He put his head down and he beat his chest and he prayed with sadness and humbleness saying, oh God, show me mercy. I am a sinner. After finishing the story, Jesus explains it through our devotional verse today, the one we just read together. He says the tax collector's prayer made him right before God, but the proud Pharisee who thought he was too good was not right with God. People who are proud and think they have no sin will be humbled, but those who are humble and admit that they are sinners like the tax collector will be lifted up by God. They will be made right with him. See, unfortunately, there are always going to be people who think that they are better than others, including ourselves, okay, and that they have no sin in their lives. We think that very often. They think that they are very good people who can please God by themselves through their good works. But the truth is that God wants us to be humble, to admit that we are sinners who need him and his forgiveness, and that we can only get this forgiveness through Jesus, that we can only receive it through God's Son. When we are humble and honest with Him, God shows us His mercy 
and grace. Now, I don't know about you, but this devotional is a great reminder of how we should always humbly confess our sin and remember that the only way we can be made right with God is through trusting in Jesus, which itself requires humility. We can't come to Jesus with pride. We have to be humble when we accept him. And so on that note, you know what? Why don't we come together right now and pray? Why don't we ask God through the Holy Spirit to make us humble, to transform us to be humble as we come to him for forgiveness and place our trust in Jesus so that we can walk humbly with him every day of the week for the rest of our lives, okay? So why don't we bring our hands together, let's bow our heads, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time that we got to spend together in your word. I, I pray for all, of the, for all of us here, and especially the Bible Town people, I pray that you would guide them this coming week, and I pray that you would teach them to be humble, that they would place their trust in you and not in themselves, that they wouldn't be proud because, well, we are all sinners. We all fall short of your glory, and we need you. We need your son, Jesus, through whom we are presented before you blameless without sin. Lord, teach us to be humble in our conversations with you, to be honest with you, to admit our sin, and to know that we can always be forgiven in the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you so much for this day. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope all of you get to spend time with Jesus every day this week. I pray that you get to walk humbly with him every day. And you know what? I, look re I really look forward to seeing you again uh, next week. God bless you all. Bye-bye. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our morning with a love that casts out
Lord, we come before you. God, we we want to start with thanks, God, with a thankful heart. I want to thank you so much. It seems so simple, but it has such an effect to, to recognize that the weather is nice. We feel those sunshine on our, that sunshine on our shoulders. How you feel the warmth on our skin, all the cool breezes. Thank you so much, God. What a comfort it is to see that bright light and enjoy it. To know that the life around us is growing and flourishing. See the green grass and the beautiful flowers. Hear the birds chirping and see the squirrels going crazy. God, I thank you so much for that. God, I thank you so much for the restrictions being lightened up that we look forward now with such eager expectation towards the church buildings being open to be able to see each other, whether in limited capacity or in other means, but to be able to see each other, to have face-to-face interactions. Thank you, God. And I thank you so much for how much those are meaning to us now. As absence makes the heart grow fonder, I pray that we would love each other all the more. And I pray that we would be in good health, that we would be able to see each other, that we wouldn't get each other sick, but instead we would be able to just be around each other without worry. Instead, rejoicing in what you've given us. I pray that you give us wisdom and discretion and guidance as we move forward. Help us to move efficiently and with wisdom and discretion and faith. Uh, that we might uh, we might be able to move forward as you desire. God, I thank you so much for who you are and who we know you to be, and I thank you for the times of prayer that we've been in that we otherwise may not have been in because we didn't have the time, we're too busy, too unfocused, or not directed, but we have been, and I thank you so much for that, God, that we can have that connection to you, that in desperation... We can pray the most candid, most heartfelt prayers. I thank you that you allow us to have that time with you. What a privilege to be able to carry these things to you in prayer. God, I pray for the states, but not just the states in Canada, not just North America, but all around the world, God, for chaos and for anarchy, for anxiety and frustration. Lord, I pray that you please help, guide us, direct us. I pray especially for Christians to show Christian character that we would be the salt, we would be the light. We would be the steady and the calm in the midst of the storm, that you would shine brightly through us, and in doing so, Bring your salvation to more and more and more people. And we would be able to rejoice in those who are being saved. Even as I hear, of, as we hear of in the States, how people are being saved. God, it's awesome how in the midst of the chaos, people see the depravity in the world and realize they need an answer in you. Thank you. You are the answer. I pray more and more people would see that and we'd be able to rejoice and delight in that, that good will come out of evil. That you can turn circumstances for the benefit of others. And I pray that we would, we would act in Christian character and in love and integrity in the way we, that we act and in the way that we pray, God. Give us the diligence and give us the accountability and the endurance to pray for this world. Well, sometimes it can be so hard on our hearts and our minds to feel what is going on. I pray that you give us that endurance and give us a love for this world. And that we would affect everyone that we can, whether by prayer or by the interactions that we have. Uh, even as it said, give us the strength to change those things that we can. Give us the grace to accept those things that we can't. 
Give us the wisdom to know, to know the difference. God, I pray that we would bless and glorify you in all things. Again, thank you so much that, uh, that this time of trial seems to be lifting. May we rejoice and delight in it. And hopefully, may we see each other's faces soon and be able to worship you together as one body in communion. In the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Well, good morning, and welcome once again to our online service of worship. I hope and pray this finds you doing well today. A father was sitting having dinner with his young son. Dad, are bugs good to eat? asked the boy. Now, son, let's not talk about gross things at the dinner table, his father replied. After they finished eating, the father inquired, Now, son, <clears throat> what was it that you wanted to ask me? Oh, nothing, said the boy. It's just there was a bug in your soup, but it's gone now because you ate it. There was another boy who was at the zoo with his father. They were looking at the tigers, and his father was telling him just how ferocious these creatures were. Daddy, if the tigers got out and, and ate you up, Yes, son, the father asked, ready to console him. Which bus would I take home? Today is Father's Day once again. Father's Day, which as one child put it, is kind of like Mother's Day, only you don't have to spend as much on the gift. And some of you are thinking, gift? <laughs> what gift? Joking aside, the truth is... There are few words that provoke a more varied response in our society than father. Feelings of honor, love, and gratitude can fill one person, while another person might be filled with feelings of shame, hatred, and, and bitterness at the mere mention of the word father. All of this points to an even deeper truth. Whether people admit it or not, father hunger is universal. We all long for a healthy and intimate relationship with someone we can call our father and are either delighted or distressed by what we have or have not experienced. Our times are marked by an epidemic of father absence. The high percentage of, of children growing up in homes where there isn't a dad present is stunning. For this reason, an understanding of God as our heavenly father can be seriously handicapped for so many people. The common language of Jesus' day in Palestine was Aramaic, so there's good reason to believe that when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, our Father who art in heaven, in Matthew 6, 9, he would have used the term Abba, which was the most intimate and tender title for Father in Aramaic. Just think of that for a second. What, what an amazing thought and privilege that is, that we are able to directly address God Almighty, the creator of the universe, as our Father, our Abba in heaven. But of course, not everyone can. This is a right given only to God's children, those saved by God's grace through faith in his son Jesus. John writes of Jesus in, in John 1.12, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The reason I begin with the fatherhood of God is because the message this morning is for everyone listening. Whether you're a father or not, and whether you have or, or had a, a Christian father or not. The sadness so many people feel at, at never having had a father like the one I'm going to describe today. Or the sadness that others might feel at never having been a father like the one I'm going to describe. That sadness can be swallowed up and overcome with joy today. Because God the Father stands ready and willing to adopt as his own child anyone who will accept his gracious gift of salvation by believing in his son Jesus. 
You see, our father hunger can only and fully be satisfied in God himself. Well, this morning, we're we're going to look at a portrait of a godly father, which we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 to 12. And and I'm going to ask you to turn there with me in your Bibles at home, if you will, to to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 to 12. We're we're going to start at the end of verse 6 and and read just these five verses here. Here's what we read, beginning at the end of verse 6. Paul writes, As an apostle of Christ, we could have been a burden to you. Verse 7, But we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word today. 1 Thessalonians is one of Paul's earliest letters, dating back to AD 50 or 51, and it provides a very personal first-hand account of Paul's relationship with this young church at Thessalonica, which was very much like that of a concerned father. Thessalonica was an important trade city. It was a bustling seaport city, in fact, the biggest in Macedonia. And the Thessalonian church there had endured intense persecution. We read in Acts 17 that when Paul planted this church at Thessalonica, a group of unbelieving Jews there became extremely jealous of the sudden growth and success of this new upstart church, which was made up largely of Gentiles. And so they set the city in an uproar. They used their influence to stir up a mob, and consequently, the members of this young Thessalonian church were subject to assault, civil prosecution, and economic persecution. After just a brief time there, Paul was suddenly forced to leave Thessalonica, and so he writes this letter in large part to encourage this young church of new believers in the serious trials that they were going through. And so this letter that Paul writes is is not only parental in nature, but it actually presents an important picture of fatherhood that that we are going to examine today in just these five verses. And that portrait begins with gentleness. Paul writes, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her children. Gentleness tends to be more of a motherly trait, as Paul acknowledges here. His point, however, is that these apostles of Christ, and he's speaking on behalf of Silas and Timothy here, these men of God exhibited gentleness among the Thessalonians. You think about it, when someone's been wounded, when someone's been seriously hurt, as the Thessalonians had been, What they need first and foremost is gentleness. Now, gentleness does not always come naturally to men. And yet, gentleness is is a vital quality for godly fathers, one that must be learned and practiced. It's been said that nothing is so strong as real gentleness. Nothing is so gentle as real strength. And the best example and teacher, of course, is Jesus himself who said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. You see, gentleness and humility must go hand in hand. In Ephesians 4, 2, Paul says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Be patient, excuse me. Bearing with one another in love. 
So how do we bear with our children? Well, we we have to be humble. That is, we have to get down to their level, meet them where they're at, put their needs first, and care for them with gentleness. That's true whether they're babies, toddlers, teenagers, or, or even adults. In fact, every Christian, parent or not, is called to exhibit gentleness to everyone around them. As Paul says in in Philippians 4, 5, let your gentleness be evident to all, to everybody. But as much as we have to learn gentleness and practice it, true gentleness is a product of the Holy Spirit of God at work in us. It's the second last, and one could argue one of the most overlooked of the fruit of the Spirit that Paul mentions in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such things there is no law. Gentleness. Well, the life of a godly father is also defined by that first fruit of the Spirit, love. In verse 8, Paul says this, We loved you so much that we delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Paul's expression of love here is very specific. And the purpose is clear. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you the gospel. As a follower of Jesus Christ, if if I truly love my children, in fact, if, if I truly love anyone, what is the most important thing I can do to show them that? Sure, spending time with them, listening to them, building a relationship with them, serving them, helping them, these are all important things, but it won't amount to a whole lot if we're not ultimately pointing them to Jesus Christ, the only truth and the only way to eternal life. It's about sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus with them throughout their entire lives, and moreover, being delighted to do it. In the original language, the words we loved you so much express an intensity of love that just keeps giving and giving over and over and over again. It's love that never fails. Love that will never give up sharing the gospel. For some people, it might take an entire lifetime of someone faithfully witnessing to them with gentleness and respect before they ever come to Christ. In 1 John 3.16, John writes, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. So it is our responsibility, our obligation to show others that love. Yes, to be willing to lay down our lives for them, but moreover to point them with our lives to Jesus Christ who laid down his life for theirs so that they can accept him for themselves so that they might know and love God as their father in heaven. The life of a godly follower is also marked by transparency. Look at verse 8. We read, We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Notice the connection there between the gospel and our lives. It's one thing to share the gospel, that is to to tell our children and, and others about the good news of Jesus Christ. But it's another thing to to show it, to to live out God's love by following his commands, to, to love him first and most, and then to love others as Christ has loved us, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and to do it all in front of our children. If we truly love our kids... They not only need to hear the gospel from our lips, they they need to see it at work in and through us, through transparent lives that are completely devoted to Jesus. The meaning of the word translated lives here actually means souls, which captures a sense of intimacy that seems to be so important to Paul here. He says, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our our very souls as well. See, it's more than just sharing information. (laughs) When you share your soul, you let a person in to see what's really there. You don't cover up your true feelings about things. 
A shared soul means sharing your passions, sharing your fears, sharing your, your true feelings, sharing your shortcomings, sharing your longings and your sorrows and your joy. And that's exactly what Paul, Silas, and Timothy shared with the Thessalonians. They shared their very souls. The gospel flourishes where that happens, where, where believers share their souls. As followers of Christ, all of us, parent or not, must consider how we are loving others. Is it a love marked not only by the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but with the sharing of our very lives, our very souls? Paul then says in verse 9, Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. This is interesting. It's the second time Paul refers to not being a burden to anyone. In order not to be a financial burden on this church, Paul supported his own ministry with a trade, which was tent making. He did this in order to avoid suspicion that he was profiting financially from his spiritual work. His hard work ethic not only set a good example, but, but it taught a powerful lesson. You see, there were many people in Thessalonica who were quitting their jobs in anticipation of Jesus' return to earth. But Paul's example taught them that they didn't have to stop what they were doing in order to be ready for Jesus' second coming, but should continue to work hard as if for the Lord and not for men while they eagerly awaited Christ's return. Well, the life of a godly father is also marked by genuine spirituality. In verse 10, Paul writes this, You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. Paul reminds them that, that they were eyewitnesses of his godly example, along with the godly example of Silas and Timothy. They were true spiritual leaders who were living, holy, righteous, and blameless examples for the church of Thessalonica. God has commissioned fathers to, to be the spiritual leaders of the home. And if there is no father or, or dad's not a Christian, it's, it's up to mom then. We are the spiritual leaders, my friends. And as the leader, we will either lead our families closer to God or further away from him. As spiritual leaders, it's our responsibility to be righteous and blameless, genuine in our example. See, our faith it can't just be something we, we, we talk about on Sunday. It has to be something that we live out all week long. So we, we must be models of what a, a life of prayer looks like, which will mean praying for and with our children in, in front of them whenever we are able. We must also model the importance of, of reading God's word to our children, discussing it, engaging in God's word. God commands and expects fathers and mothers to take an active role in the biblical instruction of their children. In fact, it is our primary role. That's up to us. It's not up to the Sunday school teacher or the youth leader or the youth pastor it is our responsibility, first and foremost, to teach our children God's word. And, and engaging God's word with our kids shouldn't be complicated. For those with young children, it, it could be as simple as, as talking with them today about what they learned in the children's devotional earlier on humility. It will mean taking some time each day to, to read a portion of God's word with them. And it will mean talking to God and about God with them. It will also mean sharing with them your story, the, the story of what God has done in your life and helping them recognize what God is doing in their lives. There is no better way to teach our children that God should be the most important person in their lives than by demonstrating that he is the most important person in our lives. Our children need to see the genuineness of our faith. See, our, our kids should never have to wonder what the life of a Christian looks like because they should be able to look straight to us and see it firsthand. 
and be able to imitate it. That's exactly what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1.6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. You see, if, if we're faithful to the Lord and live according to his word by the power of his Holy Spirit in us and our children follow in our footsteps, they will in fact be following in the footsteps of Jesus. Being the spiritual leader means so much more than, than just telling others what to do. It involves being the type of, of spiritual example that encourages our children and anyone else who might be watching us to follow Jesus Christ. Which brings us to our final point today. Verse 12, Paul writes, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. This right here is, is the real portrait of a godly father. Here's what he does. He encourages, comforts, and urges his children not just to lead a good life, but to lead a godly life, to live lives worthy of God. In the Greek, the word encourage means to, to come alongside and put courage into someone in order to build them up in Christ. And my friends, every Christian ought to be involved in this process. And we especially as fathers. The, the purpose of our encouragement is, is very clear here, isn't it? It's not simply to make our children feel good, but to help them fear God, to strengthen them, to put courage into them in order to help them be who God has called them to be, to help them live lives worthy of God. This isn't about building up their self-confidence, but building their confidence in Jesus Christ. There is no doubt about it. We need more godly fa fathers, more godly parents in this dark, sinful, and ungodly age in which we are living right now. We need men and women who, who will step up to the plate and take an active role in raising their children the way God has instructed in his word. But here's the bottom line. Regardless of whether or not you have children or ever will, no matter how young or old you might be, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all of these principles we've talked about today apply directly to you. Because God has placed specific people in each one of our lives, people who need him and who are watching us. So we don't just need more godly parents. We need more godly people. We don't just need more godly fathers. We need more godly followers, Christ followers, who will live out and display lives marked by gentleness, love, transparency, genuineness, encouragement. God has called us to be conduits of all of these, my friends, to everyone we know for this reason, so that through us, others would realize that there is indeed God, a Father in heaven who so loved them that he sent his one and only perfect son, Jesus, to die the death we deserved on the cross for our sins, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life with God, their true Father in heaven. How many people can you think of who, who need to know that regardless of the situation with their earthly father, there is a heavenly father whose love for them is so deep, it's beyond measure. A father who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all so that we could be forgiven of our sins and adopted as his sons and daughters through faith in Jesus Christ. My friends, if, if they don't hear it, from, from you and me, if they don't see that love in you and me, that they might never know it. Father hunger is universal, but at the end of the day, the best a human father can do is point his children to the love and forgiveness of God, our heavenly father. Because our, our father hunger 
can only and fully be satisfied by God himself. So, in the words of that wonderful song, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion to Christ light their way. And may the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we've lived inspire them to obey. Amen. receive the Lord's blessing. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. The Lord bless you.